Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're located. Welcome to Hub International Risk Services Keep Drivers Productive Through Wellness webinar. All lines are muted to ensure there no there's no background noise. And if you have a question during the webinar, please mail the question to christine.jacobs at hubinternational.com and we'll collect these questions, comments, so and answer them at the end of the presentation. And we will make sure we answer everyone's inquiries. Our agenda for today includes a little about Hub and our speakers, the scope of the wellness and the driver wellness problem, how to build a wellness program, additional best practices for driver wellness, a discussion about absence management, and questions from our listeners. About today's presenters, I'm Steve Bojan, Vice President and Transportation Practice Leader at Hub International Risk Services. I've been with Hub for five and a half years and in working in the transportation industry for almost 25 years in, on both the insurance safety and uh, the trucking operations and risk management side. Renee Mataliano is a Senior Vice President of Workforce Productivity with Hub Risk Services. She's been with Hub for nine years, has more than 30 years in wellness and absence management, and has a Master's in Vocational Rehabilitation from Michigan State University. A little about Hub. Hub International is based in Chicago, Illinois. It's the eighth largest global insurance broker. It's the leading transportation insurance broker in the United States. We have more than 300 locations across North America and more than 9,000 clients to serve our 9,000 employees to serve our clients. Well, let's start by talking about where things stand today with drivers and wellness. Let's first begin with the driver of our dreams, the fantasy when I was working as a dispatcher some 25 years ago. He's healthy, he's safe, he's very productive, he comes to work every day energized, dedicated to the task, to his company, and his clients. He's well-liked and supported by both his teammates uh, and, and management. That doesn't happen too often. Driver wellness, we want to talk about a description of uh, a, a definition of wellness. Wellness is an interactive process of becoming aware and practicing healthy choices to create a more successful and balanced lifestyle. So that we can create those drivers, so those drivers of, of our dreams can come back into existence. The scope of the issue, it's kind of scary to be perfectly frank. The average age of an over the road truck driver in the United States today is about 51. His life expectancy is 61. We're very quickly coming to a precipice in terms of the driver shortage and going over that cliff if we don't, if we don't improve something. Um, more than 73% of truck drivers are overweight. More than 50% suffer from some chronic health disorder. Could include sleep apnea, high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, or others. Um, and consequently, there's a sh presently a shortage of 30 to 50,000 truck drivers in North America. They're getting older. They're generally not in particularly good health. And we have a shortage, which is going to only grow if we don't change the way we do things. When we talk about driver-related work injuries, workers in trucking experience the most fatalities of any occupation, accounting for 12% of all worker deaths. An incredible number and something that is really not reported on very much because they are generally highway fatalities, which are not shocking. They're, it's not like they're crane, not like cranes falling in New York City. Two thirds of these fatalities were involved were involved uh, highway crashes, which, to be frank, seems low when you start thinking about. A lot of drivers are killed whether it's at the dock, a die at the dock, or just in their vehicle when not driving. Um, 
Truck drivers also have more non-fatal injuries on average than any other occupation in the United States. Over 50% are serious sprains and strains. Primarily these are, the majority of their, of their injuries are soft tissue and it's hard to determine where they occurred or how they occurred because of the nature of the business where, they're, where these employees are remote and out on the road. We talk about the impact of poor health in the, in the workplace you know, for drivers. Basically, um, the average employer spends $13,000 per employee per year on total direct and indirect health care costs. And when you look at the second little column here, it says 80% of medical spending goes towards chronic health conditions. It's easy to see why truck drivers have a higher spend than any than most other industries when you consider more than 50% of drivers have chronic health conditions. That's 30% that's 30 higher, well, a 30% increase over the average American. You know, chronic injury, chronic health conditions are on the rise in all groups, groups. And a lot of that is due to very poor health decisions which is kind of the nature of the trucking industry. I'll note, now turn it over to Renee. Thanks, Steve, and welcome, everyone. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about the fact that there are a number of factors that influence whether an employee uh, chooses to be fit and stay healthy and productive. And if you take a look at the top half of this circle, how uh, an employer hires, how they select their employees is critical to maintaining the health and productivity of the workforce. Their hiring experience, how they are trained, how they are motivated to do their jobs, not only their job tasks, but do them safely, uh, will be important in keeping the employee healthy on the job. And of course, the type of insurance programs, benefit programs, if there's career growth opportunity, their compensation, how financially secure they are, and whether rewards and recognition are offered uh, to employees also will be a determining factor in how engaged they are in their work and should they have some medical disruption that takes them away from work, either on the job or off the job, how fast they are to try and get back to work. Also programs, if we take a look at the lower half of the circle, programs in the areas of prevention, so safety and of course uh, wellness, which we're talking about today, how illnesses and injuries are dealt with when they do happen, and how people are returned to work, and what sort of support services in the form of employee assistance programs or advocacy programs uh, to help them when they do have uh, a medical condition that uh, affects their productivity. All of these will have an impact on the health and the fitness and the productivity of your employees. In addition, the culture and the connection that an employer has with their employees through communications and, as I said, through the different types of programs uh, that are offered can make a big difference in keeping employees healthy and on the job and returning them as soon as possible when they uh, uh, are able to return to work. So on the next slide, we'll talk about the fact that there are some premises we will discuss. Um, healthier and happier employees are more productive employees. And those that you find that, that are a good fit for the job are going to seek less time away from work and return as soon as possible if they do experience a medical problem. Healthier employees are less likely to call in sick or use vacation time due to illness and employees' health frequently carries over to better health behaviors for the whole family so that when a family disruption occurs, the employee uh, will take as little time as possible uh, for those instances as well. 
And premise two, which is on the next slide, uh, it, employers, all of us, have control over who we hire. So it's very important to make good decisions on who gets hired and, as I said, that they are the right fit and that they have tools to make hiring decisions and the best hiring decisions possible. And you also, as an employer, have the ability to determine how an employee's work is structured, how much control over the environment they have and you have to perform their job and also, as I mentioned, the benefits and the programs that are offered to attract and retain your employees. So we know that getting the right programs in place and setting up an effective wellness program, especially in the transportation industry, is going to be a team effort uh, across many departments or many individuals within your organizations, human resources, safety, operations, um, recruiters, uh, to make sure that you're getting the right uh, folks in the job and that they are well supported and trained uh, on the job. When we think about the fit employee, we, we like to discuss it in terms of the employee life cycle. So as I mentioned, um, how you select employees, how you onboard and train them, what types of prevention programs you have in place and when individuals do become ill or injured, how do you manage those individuals when they're gone and help them return to work, and what sorts of benefits and total rewards package uh, do you have to help uh, the employee during their tenure with you. So we'll talk about each of these uh, in order. In terms of selection and hiring, there are many tools that can help you in the proper selection and hiring of individuals. And we know that in the transportation industry that it's hard to find good drivers. And oftentimes, the need is greater than the supply. But to the extent that you can help define the, the job, the very specific physical requirements of the job that individuals are going to do and match those to an individual who's capable and qualified to perform the job, the better off the employee will be and you as an employer will be um, down the road. There's also skill-based testing. There are personality tests. There are judgment capacity tests pre-employment physicals and drug testing, background checks, reference checks, and also some uh, functional capacity testing, again, to ensure that uh, an individual has the physical capabilities to perform the job that you need them to do. And we'll talk about some of these in, in more detail. If I can add in. Sure. I can jump in. Uh, while many of the things we're talking about on this slide are required by the FMCSA or DOT, they can be great tools to selecting good drivers. Um, one of the biggest challenges in any commercial fleet, whether it's transportation, distribution, or construction and others, is like, as Renee said, that shortage of driver. And we often get in the very bad habit of instead of selecting, you know, we, we're not qualifying or disqualifying drivers. People are hired until there's a problem. We need to, the, the focus we're talking about here is picking good people, picking the right people who can do the work and, and will do a good job. And really using these tools goes a long way uh, to reducing turnover, which improves performance and overall fleet safety. Thanks, Steve. Uh, so when we talk about job analysis or job descriptions, basically what we're talking about is making sure that all of the essential functions are appropriately documented uh, for, the, for the driver's job. So detail the physical requirements, all of the job duties, 
um, the skills and competencies that you require in any education and experience or any certifications that you require as well. The more an individual knows about the job and what they're getting into, the less likely they are to become disengaged or even uh, injured uh, because they're well prepared for what the job requirements are going to be. When we talk about on the next slide the types of testing that several organizations use, some use personality tests and that can help you determine how a worker is going to fit within your overall culture and with their coworkers. However, um, we feel that there are other tools that measure judgment that are much better in terms of predicting how an employee is going to perform in their job. And when we talk about judgment, we're talking about how an individual values work, um, how they make decisions when they're under stress, what kind of decision-making skills they have, how they follow instructions, which are all critically important in the transportation industry. Uh, because the safety not only of the driver, but of everyone around that driver um, are critically important and impacted by the judgments and decisions that a driver makes. So we prefer uh, those types of pre-employment uh, testing to give you more information on an individual's judgment capacity as it relates to uh, a driving uh, position. And with that, I'll turn it over to Steve to talk a little bit more about pre-employment and DOT physicals. Thank you, <coughs> thank you, Renee. When we, you know. Pre-employment DOT physicals are required for all commercial drive for all commercial CDL drivers, all interstate commercial drivers in 10 to 26,000 pounds, and in most states where uh, commercial drivers are driving 10 to 26,000 pounds. So it's a big group of drivers that must take these tests. It really is, and we can't stress enough how important how important it is to select a medical provider for DOT physicals as opposed to letting your, your drivers go to a, a physician um, of their choice. Even with the, new, with the relatively new FMCSA registry for approved medical providers, there's a huge variation in the quality of these physicals and the care that, the, that these medical providers, they can be doctors, they can be nurse practitioners, they can be chiropractors. Uh, even under the present system, uh, of, of the quality of their review of the individual. The medical provider should understand the requirements of the driving position. Is that driver going to be uh, doing deliveries? Is he just bumping docks? Is he just dropping loads? Um, does he need to get in and out of the cab of his vehicle 10 or 20 times a day? So they, when they're making an assessment of the driver, they can have a, a picture in their mind of whether this individual is capable of doing the work. You know, and, and that really leads to the next point, which is upgraded physicals that include functional capacity exams are a best practice. These FCEs uh, test, provi uh, provide physical testing of the driver recruit about whether he can perform the physical parts of the job aside from driving the truck, which are, you know, is, is really the primary concern of a DOT physical. These would include lowering dolly legs, being able to unload a truck or, tra or trailer, um, getting, you know, uh, hand, you know, tarping loads, other things that have a higher level of requirement of physicality than just moving a truck backward and forward. So it, the, the functional capacity exam is a great tool, and really, it's we want to make sure that our that the people we hire aren't going to hurt themselves. It's not that we don't want to hire folks; it's that we want to make sure they're a good fit for the job and they're not a hazard to themselves. Um, also, physicals of both the DOT and if you do an upgraded physical 
Um, develop a medical baseline for employee health. We know where they stand when they started and when they have these regularly, regularly scheduled, regularly required exams. So we can see if, if, if they're going forward or backward and, and, and for injury management, this can be a great tool. Um, and, and again, with the FCE, we want to confirm, and, and the physical, that the, that the candidate has the capacity to perform the essential functions of the job. A number of years ago, I worked as a risk manager for a trucking company, and recruiters are paid to recruit all types of folks to be drivers, not necessarily um, people who are capable of uh, doing heavy physical labor, but you know, you, you'll see folks come through, you know, the recruiting office and, and at times it can be amazing whether they can get in and out of the vehicle. And it's really important that we make sure that they're capable of doing the job because uh, back in my, again, in my days in risk management for trucking, the worst thing that you, that you hear, the worst phone call you can get is that somebody passed away on the road or that uh, one of your drivers is severely injured. And that does happen, and oftentimes <clears throat> it's not directly related to driving or to the handling of freight. So we want to make sure these people can do the work. The other area I'm going to talk about briefly is substance abuse testing uh, and, and awareness. First and foremost, it must be compliant with the FMCSA regulations, and that includes the pre-employment, the random program, reasonable suspicion, post-accident. What it comes down to is it must be done in a scientific manner and very professional. We, at Hub, we suggest the outsourcing of the management of these programs, but with every company that has CDL drivers that are required to participate, that their HR or safety department oversee their out, outside vendors to make sure that the programs are being handled appropriately and correctly. Drivers need to be educated on the dangers of substance abuse and how it affects their ability to do their job, both from a performance standpoint and a legal standpoint. Um, this has become all the more complex as we now have five states where marijuana has been legalized uh, for consumption, for recreational consumption. Many drivers, some drivers don't understand that while Marijuana may be, le may be legal in certain states at the state level to use recreationally. It's still illegal to be under any influence of marijuana or any other illicit drug while driving a commercial motor vehicle. Um, also, the, you know, this also is important with alcohol abuse. For CDL drivers, the blood alcohol maximum is not 0.08, but it's 0.04. So we need to perform support a drug-free and alcohol-free workplace and protect our organization from the impact of drug abuse because when people are over the road, there is this, uh, they do sort of have a lot of freedom and they need to know what, what the, their limitations are and also how these uh, various drugs can affect their system and their ability to drive safely. Um, the new OSHA regulations prevent blanket post-work related injury drug testing, so any substance abuse testing program, while it, will, it needs to be compliant with FMCSA regulations, you also need to take into account the new OSHA policies. That being said, fleets can still test post-crash on any, uh, for substance abuse, um, any time there's a crash, they just need to know that consistency is really important and that they have a plan, a policy in place before going ahead and doing any testing. Um, lastly, as we see down at the bottom of the slide, uh, drug-related drug issues cost employers more than $81 billion each year due to reduced productivity, injuries, fatalities, absence, and other issues. It is a huge challenge to anybody who works with a, a, a fleet um, because of the fact that we don't always see the ramifications of substance abuse until a crash occurs. We're now going to talk about comprehensive wellness. 
So in order to keep uh, workers safe and healthy, uh, more and more employers are looking at establishing uh, wellness programs. And wellness traditionally has meant physical health uh, and in some instances psychological health. But wellness programs have evolved now to overall well-being. And what we mean by that is not only is there a focus on physical and mental health, but also on financial health, on spiritual health, anything that really affects the employee's overall life. Companies are offering resources as part of their wellness program uh, to their employees. Fewer than half of American workers say that their companies really support this kind of effort right now, but we're also seeing a rise in wellness initiatives across the, the country, across all types of industries, which we anticipate will continue into the coming years. When building a uh, wellness or well-being model, as you'll see on the next slide, it really requires that uh, leadership have a, a strong commitment and that there is a strategic plan and the proper support for the kinds of things that uh, you as an employer want to provide support for uh, to your employees. And the types of resources, which is on slide 25, that uh, are usually included in a well-being program. Again, uh, preventative screenings. So oftentimes there are incentives for reducing uh, health insurance premiums uh, if you go for preventative screenings or have biometric tests and participate in, in some type of wellness uh, effort. Uh, nutrition and diet. Um, online tools for researching how to eat better and also physical activity so uh, things like Fitbits you know for tracking your physical activity uh, different types of um, su supporting different types of um, challenges within the organization so runs and walks and also some companies actually uh, do gym reimbursements as well and then most of uh, wellness programs will also include resources and information on sleep management, diabetes, and obesity, since those are uh, highly prevalent, and also any other types of chronic health conditions. Uh, some more comprehensive wellness programs will include health coaching which is one-on-one -on -one coaching uh, through a, a vendor or perhaps even an on-site uh, individual uh, to help with um, health behaviors and making sure that people are making the right choices. Uh, on-site clinics, um, and this pertains to employers that have a large presence in one place. Um, obviously, with transportation companies, employees are all over and most are remote. So um, a lot of the support comes more via uh, telephonic interventions and uh, online interventions. And then also integrating data. So once some of this data is collected uh, through health risk assessments, um, as well as participation in wellness programs, employers can make better determinations how they would like to spend their money and support their employees. And actually, wellness programs don't necessarily have to cost a lot. There are a lot of resources online that organizations can uh, access and actually set up themselves. So there's uh, WellCOA, which is W-E-L-C-O-A, which has a very minimal um, financial membership to belong, but a lot of resources available uh, to distribute to uh, your employees. Uh, there are certainly vendors that help set up uh, 
uh, programs, wellness and well-being programs, and, uh, and certainly consultants like uh, Hub actually have several wellness consultants that also assist with helping companies set up their wellness programs. And on the next slide, in terms of getting engagement, um, we'll flip a couple more slides, Steve. Um, getting engagement into the health uh, and well-being program. Communication is critically important uh, to make sure that your employees understand what resources are available and that there's targeted communication. So oftentimes this will come from an understanding of your data and knowing what sorts of health risks exist in your workforce so that communication targeted to those specific uh, types of uh, conditions can be distributed appropriately. And you can flip to the next slide, please. And there's communication certainly that can be personalized. Uh, and that always can make a big difference in terms of an individual's participation and engagement in uh, their own wellness and their own well-being. Offering the opportunity for people to uh, get information via paper copies, electronic, and different apps or, or texting, uh, all of these types of medium should be considered and employed to communicate uh, out any resources and the availability of well-being programs uh, within your workforce. Establishing a wellness committee, wellness champions, uh, to keep this front and center with your employees will be important and also that the communication, as we mentioned, not only be targeted and personalized, but also is continuous. So that there's not just a communication around open enrollment time, but there's also communication throughout the year uh, on a monthly basis or quarterly basis, uh, so that there are different types of information, education, and campaigns that are going out to uh, your workforce. And on the next slide, we talked about the fact that um, health, of course, is very important, but also things that affect your employees from financial matters to personal relationship um, issues create stress. And stress definitely carries over from our personal lives into our work lives. And being able to assist your employees with handling those stressors, whether it be through your wellness program, through an employee assistance program, um, addressing work-life balance and how to manage difficult family situations, financial situations will go a long way in supporting the health and productivity of your employees. So sometimes that might mean offering resources on stress management and coping skills, on financial planning, um, I, a, a very uh, big area right now is on ID protection and identity theft. More and more companies are offering this as a benefit to their, to their employees um, because I'm sure probably everyone on the phone has had an experience with having a credit card stolen or their identity stolen and it's not an easy thing to, to fix. So there's a lot of really interesting resources that companies are providing to help with these uh, more difficult situations. And Steve, I'll let you talk a little bit about safety and the environment uh, and what sorts of things employers are, are putting in place to help with preventing injuries and illnesses. We've moved into a new place with, with, with safety for, for safety and, and, and injury prevention for drivers. Uh, first and foremost is the need to communicate how important safety is. You know, that it's not just about getting the job done. It's about getting the job done safely and getting things to where they need to be 
because it doesn't do any good if you get hurt in the process. Um, so communication is critical and it's constantly growing and it's and that especially because our drivers are really working in most cases remotely if we don't communicate to them while in the office they don't get any feedback so we need to be preemptive in making sure they know what what our ex, what the organization's expectations are and how they want things done um, Stretch and flex programs uh, have become much more prevalent than in the past where we educate our employees on proper stretching techniques prior to doing any physical activity because they are going oftentimes from being very cold driving a vehicle for a, a, a long period of time to being very hot where they are unloading product or in the case of garbage men, um, you know, putting things, you know, waste and refuse into the truck. Um, these programs have had a lot of success, but they, the critical part is there has to be management buy-in. Um, you know, that the more these people stretch, the less likely they are to be injured. And this has become even more important with an aging workforce so that we don't bounce back from this hot and cold, this hot to cold to hot situation, or excuse me, cold to hot cold to hot to cold situation as well as we did when we were younger. So uh, ergonomic assessments that help we do these all the time and they're becoming much more prevalent for fleets. Making sure that the, uh, the vehicles are set up in a way that's conducive to, to, to driver comfort and safety and, and looking for technologies that are going to allow uh, the drivers to have less work-related hazards or, or, or injury or likely injury causes while out on the road. Um, we, you know, some of those include, as we have here, automatic transmissions, um, air slide trailers where the drivers no longer have to get under and pound the pins to slide the rear, uh, the rear tires, the rear bogies on the uh, trailers. Um, in cab fifth wheel feel excuse me in cab fifth wheel releases so that drivers uh, don't have to get out and pull, get you know get their arm under the trailer to uh, release the fifth wheel which in the past has led to a lot of shoulder injuries and those are some of the technological improvements and then the other thing is really uh, when we talk about ergonomics when we look and see that there are some hazards it's creating training programs, and again, it helps we do this with our clients all the time, on safe work practices. Reminding drivers that they need to use three points of contact whenever they get in and out of their vehicle to avoid slips and falls getting in and out of their vehicle. It is one of the most important things to remind drivers. Uh, some other proper work techniques include how to correctly lift boxes and other items you know, lifting with your legs as opposed to your back, keeping um, it in your power area, you know, holding objects close in, um, not stretching and straining uh, when, you know, uh, and contorting yourself to lift heavy objects. How to correctly dolly up and dolly down trailer legs so that you don't, you don't get hit in the face with the, uh, with the landing gear handle or hurt, you know, hurt your shoulder in the process of doing it. Um, and in load securement, what are some, uh, how to correctly secure a load, how to, th how to you know, move, train move chains through uh, steel coils or use straps um, and other tools such as sliding uh, um, the Conestoga tarps or even closing a trailer door so that you don't get hurt in the process. These techniques are critical to avoiding injury and keeping our drivers safe. Now I'll turn it back to Renee and talk about meeting the needs of drivers. Oh, I think I have this section. I apologize. Um, you know, first here we're going to talk for a minute about utilization of health insurance. One of the big challenges we have in wellness is that drivers often view their DOT physical as the only physical they need. 
you know, they view that as a health assessment and that if, if they can pass that for two years, that everything is good. Uh, many of the insurance programs that are offered to drivers that are paid for by their employers offer online or in-person health assessments. Um, they're confidential, they're easy to take, and they do a great job of, of providing information to drivers as to what they need to do to have a healthier lifestyle. Annual physicals, especially as, as drivers and other employees get older in age, are critical, and they're often free to the employee. They're paying for something that they're not using because they're either afraid, they don't have time, or they just don't like dealing with doctors. Uh, it, it's a great opportunity for them to see what they can do to improve, whether it's smoking cessation or uh, better eating habits, working with a dietitian, Working with, closely with their personal physician is, is a great way to improve the health of our employees. Um, also, getting them to use the screening programs that are often free or at a low cost, such as screening for cancer, which is more likely in truck drivers in the general population, and also heart disease. These are some really important tools that are there um, that are being paid for and often aren't taken advantage of. And last we have here, driver fitness. A lot of health insurance programs have a fitness component that allows uh, employees to enroll at, at health clubs or other places at a lower cost. Also, for truck drivers, there's a number of trucking organizations that specialize in fitness, and some of which uh, can be paid for by their health insurance policy. It's just educating them to look what are the benefits of their policy and how can they be best utilized. There's uh, Rolling Strong is a really good one, and there's others. There's the story of the, of the truck driver who set up a program with his doctor to walk a mile every day. He figured out how many times he had to walk around his, his tractor trailer to equal a mile, and he built up his walking over time, and he lost over 50 pounds. It was a great story, and it shows how drivers can lead healthier lifestyles out on the road. The other part of this is driver education. They need to know that these tools are available. Uh, when we have safety meetings, driver wellness, injury prevention needs to be part of that meeting, be part of that discussion, not just to focus on defensive driving and, and distracted driving, which are equally critical, but how to make wellness part of their overall um, you know, their overall safety strategy, because one of the leading causes of crashes is fatigue, and a leading uh, cause of fatigue is, un is an unhealthy driver. Some other things we can educate our drivers on are these online tools, such as Rolling Strong. On Facebook, there are some social media groups. Uh, there's some groups to that talk about how, you know, safe uh, driver wellness and, and, and and, and how to live uh, how to live healthily on the road. And then lastly, I think when we talk about education, um, those mailings home or those check stuffers, while the truck drivers may not be as concerned about wellness as they should be, oftentimes their loved ones are. They read these mailings and they will question and ask the spouse or the or the parent about mm -hmm. about these issues and how that these employees, how these folks, how their loved ones can be healthier and increase and increase their lifespan. So it's really a good idea to, to have a comprehensive driver education program in place on wellness. Now we'll turn it back over to Renee and talk about absence management. So we know that individuals and uh, employees are, are going to become ill or injured. I mean, it just will happen. As much as we would like to prevent that, and we've talked about a number of ways to, to do that, we do know that it, with some employees, uh, illness or injury will occur. And so understanding the, the data behind injuries and illnesses that do occur 
is very important not only from a financial perspective uh, to the company, but also in terms of understanding, again, the, the health risks that exist and how you can best support your employees to keep them healthy. And when they do become ill or injured, how you can help them get back to work as soon as possible. So we know that organizations spend um, quite a bit of money on absence in the workplace. Uh, the direct costs of absence are uh, the cost of benefits that you may provide to your employees, as well as uh, workers' compensation and any benefits that may be paid out if you're self-insured, and certainly premiums or other fees if, if you're fully insured. But the real impact to the organization is the productivity costs, and those are what we would call indirect in nature, although many of them are direct costs to the company, and that is when someone has gone from work. Either you're losing productivity, someone has to fill in and perhaps incur overtime, or maybe there's temporary employees that need to be brought in to cover the work. So. What we find is that the indirect or the productivity costs are generally uh, three times what the uh, direct costs are. So as we go to the next slide, um, the important thing is to really understand what co the cost drivers are, um, what the impact to your bottom line is, and what procedures, programs, policies may be changed or enhanced in order to help reduce and mitigate those, those costs of, of absence and lost productivity. And as we've talked about throughout this presentation, making sure that you've got the right people, the right processes, and that you have uh, an integrated look at what's going on with individuals who may be out of work for either a disability-related issue, FMLA, workers' comp, um, any reason they might be gone and why they're gone, to really understand that so that you can develop a wellness initiative uh, that, that targets those particular issues and also then really helps focus keeping healthy people healthy and helping those that are unhealthy correct those unhealthy behaviors and hopefully prevent being ill or injured. And the reason it's really important to look at this from an integrated perspective is um, what we talk about on, on the next slide, and that is that um, you want to be data-driven. You want to understand what's going on across all of your programs, across your workforce, uh, so that you can best choose the programs the policies, the plan design, the benefit products that are going to help uh, mitigate any um, financial impact or resource impact of people being gone from work. The first step, uh, which we'll start talking about on the next slide, to evaluating all of this is really looking at these programs in detail and understanding the data. And as we talked about earlier in the presentation with uh, well-being or wellness initiatives, if you also have health risk assessments, uh, those can certainly be part of this process. Uh, so looking at what health risks exist as well as the causes of people going out of work for either a work-related or non-work-related injury or illness. Understanding the patterns, the trends, the costs, and all of the HR policies and procedures that surround these programs so that, uh, so that any gaps can be identified and then a plan can be put in place to close those gaps and improve how the programs function uh, most and keep them efficient and keep your workforce um, engaged even when they are gone from work. And this is really an iterative process. So taking the first step of doing an analysis and putting uh, some enhancements in place, and then as, as we talk about on the next slide, the second step is to implement that change and then always monitor and adjust 
uh, to the findings and the impact that it's having on the organization. And lastly, as we, as Steve and I close um, our portion of the presentation, um, on the last slide, the the idea here is that there are many influencers, as we talked about early on. There's the recruiting and the onboarding process, uh, your total rewards package, including insurance programs and other uh, benefits that you offer, as well as um, how you work with an employee that might go out for some personal uh, illness or a work-related illness. But obviously what what we're focusing on today is how to prevent those things from happening, the tools and the programs that are available, especially in the transportation industry, to help drivers stay more healthy and ultimately more productive. And uh, should they become ill or injured, uh, be able to return to work as soon as possible. So with that, Steve, do you have any other closing remarks? Thanks, Renee. Absolutely. It, one of the biggest challenges in transportation is keeping people at work every day. Unlike uh, other factory environments and other industries, if drivers are not in their seats in the morning, product isn't being delivered or uh, somebody else is having to work a longer day. Um, there is no getting around it. Um, so make, having people healthier and at work more days is, is definitely a boom. And additionally, I think the other thing that makes this whole discussion about driver wellness and absence man management so critical is the movement in the transportation industry the, or the increased focus on last mile delivery services where drivers are having to become more involved in the physical nature of the work. Um, so really, you know, utilizing all of these tools is becoming that, that much more critical because of the fact drivers have to use good judgment, they have to know what they're doing, and they have to be able to do things that they were, that there was, that they were never called upon to do before. Uh, these are folks who have a, a lot of pressure and are out generally all day and, and, and have, you know, and are looking at, at their employers to provide some support. So thank you very much. Um, also, the Hub, Inter Hub Risk Services has an absence management and productivity group that works with clients uh, to improve their wellness and productivity of their drivers. Um, now let's move on and see if there are any questions. Please feel free to send them in at this time. We do have one question that came in, and that's how many hub clients have put wellness programs in place? That's a really good question. Um, I do know of one that has a comprehensive wellness program for drivers. Um, it's a distribution organization, and they are one of the safest fleets we work with, and, and they really have human resources, safety, uh, employee benefits, all very much integrated in operations um, to improve driver wellness. Aside from that one organization, we do have other clients that have components of a wellness program, um, such as educating drivers on uh, you know, how to better use their health insurance, uh, functional capacity exams um, and, and some, you know, some health improvement programs. They use the Rolling Strong program, and they send home a lot of literature, provide a lot of education on driver wellness to their drivers. That being said, when they have these components, where our where Hubbard Services does a very good job of getting involved, is putting it all into a more comprehensive system so that it greatly increases effectiveness and, um, and that we're better able to measure um, what's occurring and how to make changes to improve the process, really creating a much more systematic approach to wellness. 
Did you have any thoughts, Renee? Yeah, I think that, that that's the key when a wellness initiative is put in place, that there are many facets, and uh, you just want to make sure that it's well-coordinated, well-supported, and that there's training and educational materials uh, for each component of, of the wellness um, initiative. So um, that's something, obviously, that will be uh, important for a successful program. Well, thank you very much, Renee. I greatly appreciate your participation this morning, and thank you to everyone that dialed in. Um, please feel free to contact Renee or myself um, if you would like. The presentation will be available online at hubinternational.com, um, and we look forward to your additional questions in the future. Thank you very much, and have a safe day. Thank you.